Well, it was not a good day for the Trump fanatics on the Republican-controlled House Judiciary Committee, and it was not a great day for their star witness. Republican former U.S. Attorney Robert Herr, who was appointed to as a U.S. Attorney by Donald Trump, conducted the investigation of Joe Biden's possession of classified material after Joe Biden left the vice presidency. That investigation found that Joe Biden did not commit any crimes at all. And we learned today in the hearing that Robert Hur's report about Joe Biden was not accurate in its description of Joe Biden as an elderly man with unusual memory problems. And you'll remember that bit was the big news of that report, the news that was heard around the world about that report, and it is false. Today, Attorney General Merrick Garland released the full transcript of President Biden's five hours of under oath questioning by Robert Hur. In his report, Robert Hur claimed that President Biden could not remember when his son died. That is not true. In the transcript, President Biden says, what month did Bo die? Oh, my God. May 30th. And then someone else in the room with the president says 2015, and President Biden says it was 2015. And it's now easy to understand Joe Biden's anger about Robert Hur's false characterization of the president's memory of that tragic day. Congressman Eric Swalwell, who will join us in a moment, finds, found something else in the transcript released today of Joe Biden's testimony about Joe Biden's memory that Robert Hur deliberately did not include in his report describing the president's memory. I now want to turn you to the transcript and day one, page 47. You said to President Biden, you have appear to have a photographic understanding and recall of the House. Did you say that to President Biden? Those words do appear on page 47 of the transcript. Photographic is what you said. Is that right? That word does appear on page 47 of the transcript. Never appeared in your report, though. Is that correct? The word photographic? That does not appear in my report. Carson Swalwell zeroed in on a possible motivation for Robert Hur to slant his report against Joe Biden in every way that he could. A lot has changed since 2018 for the person who appointed you, former President Trump. Since you were appointed, uh, he was impeached for leveraging 350 U.S. 350 million U.S. taxpayer dollars over Ukraine to get dirt on President Biden. He was then in impeached a second time for inciting an insurrection. He was charged for possessing classified documents and obstructing justice. He was charged for paying for the silence of a porn star. He was charged in Georgia for his role in January 6. He was charged in the District of Columbia for his role in January 6. He owes $400 million to the state of New York uh, for defrauding the state through his taxes and he has been judged a rapist. You want to be perceived, understandably, as credible, and so I want to first see if you will pledge to not accept an appointment from Donald Trump if he is elected again as president. Congressman, I, I don't, I'm not here to testify Seems like an easy about answer. what will happen it's in the considering future. Considering what I just laid out. I'm here to, I'm here to talk about the, the report and the work yeah. that went into it. And but you don't want to be associated with that guy again, do you? Congressman, I'm not here to offer any opinions about what may or may not happen in the future. So it's fair to interpret that what you just saw obviously means that what may happen in the future is that Robert Hur would accept a federal judgeship from the indicted Donald Trump or serve as the indicted Donald Trump's attorney general. Republicans on the committee kept trying to suggest that Robert Hur would have recommended criminal charges against Joe Biden if, Bi if President Biden were just younger, that it was simply Joe Biden's elderly, faulty memory that would make him hard to convict in a courtroom.
But the truth of the her report is that it does not at any point identify a single criminal act that could be prosecuted against anyone at any age. It did not identify a single thing Joe Biden did that anyone has ever been prosecuted for. And the only classified material that Joe Biden knew he possessed was exactly the same material that President Ronald Reagan kept when he left the presidency and the and the Justice Department at that time believed that what President Reagan did was perfectly legal and they justified it. President Ronald Reagan kept daily notes during his time in the White House and Vice President Joe Biden kept similar daily notes during his eight years as vice president. Those notes would inevitably contain possibly classified information. And those notes were deliberately kept by Joe Biden following the legal precedent set by Ronald Reagan and the Justice Department when Ronald Reagan deliberately kept those same notes. And so the simple facts of the Biden case are there was no criminal prosecution because there was absolutely nothing that was even close to a criminal act. Democrats used the hearing today to remind America what it's like when the possession and handling of classified material is criminal. In your investigation, did you find that President Biden directed his lawyer to lie to the FBI? We identified no such evidence. Did you find that President Biden directed his lawyer to destroy classified documents? No. Did you find that President Biden directed his personal assistant to move boxes of documents to hide them from the FBI? No. Did you find that President Biden directed his personal assistant to delete security camera footage after the FBI asked for that footage? No. Did you find that President Biden showed a classified map related to an ongoing military operation to a campaign aide who did not have clearance? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a conspiracy to obstruct justice? No. Did you find that President Biden engaged in a scheme to conceal? No. Each of the activities I just laid out describe what Donald Trump did in his willful mishandling of classified information and his criminal efforts to deceive the FBI. Congresswoman Madeleine Dean, who will join us in a moment, forced Robert Hur to make the case against Donald Trump by reading what Hur's report says about the Trump case. Unlike the evidence involving Mr. Biden, the allegations set forth in the indictment of Mr. Trump, if proven, would present serious aggravating facts. Keep going. Uh, Congresswoman, I'm happy to have you read the words in my report. Well, it's your report, so I think it actually is more fitting that you read those. Most notably, after being given multiple chances to return classified documents and avoid prosecution, Mr. Trump allegedly did the opposite. Keep going. According to the indictment, he not only refused to return the documents for many months, but he also obstructed justice by enlisting others to destroy evidence and then to lie about it. And we have new information about Donald Trump's handling of government-owned documents and classified documents from the witness who Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's indictment identifies as Trump employee number five. That employee, Brian Butler, said in a CNN interview that he helped Trump co-defendant Walt Nauta move some of the boxes from Florida to New Jersey. We got to the airport. I ended up loading all the luggage I had, and he had a bunch of boxes. You noticed that he had boxes? Oh, yeah. They were the uh, boxes that were in the indictment, the white banker's boxes. That's what I remember loading. And did you have any idea at the time that there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. Brian Butler explained why he is speaking out now publicly. Well, I mean, it's it's been almost a year since FBI agents showed up at the at my house when my wife was at home, and you know, over the course of the last year, emotionally, it's been a roller coaster. You know, a couple of weeks ago, it, you know, Judge Cannon says she's going to release the names of the witnesses. You know, you go from highs and lows in this, and. Instead of just waiting for it to just come out, I think it's better that I get to at least say what happened than it coming out in the news, people calling me like crazy. I'd rather just get it out there. 
And Brian Butler offered this account of Donald Trump sharing classified information with an Australian billionaire. I believe it was April of 2021. Um, there was a member, Anthony Pratt, who he was coming. He, he flew in the night before. He's an Australian billionaire. He finishes his meeting with the former president, gets in the car, and his chief of staff says, how did the meeting go? Pratt, without saying, just says, he told me, and it would be, you know, U.S. military, you know, classified information of what he told them about Russian submarines and U.S. submarines. And that's really all I remember hearing, and I went, what? You know, I'm thinking this. I'm in the car. I'm like, did I just hear that? So it, it wasn't like... Oh, the meeting went well. We talked about it. it. was He went straight to the point. He told me that the U.S. subs and with the Russian subs and, you know, something that would pro more than likely, in my mind, be classified. Please go on about the false factual findings. Uh, could you give us some examples of those? Sure. I think, Lawrence, the most obvious one that uh, your many listeners will recognize right away is the false finding in the Citizens United decision that nobody needed to worry about corruption because all of the unlimited spending that that decision would unleash would be transparent that the public could evaluate the motive of the big donors because they would know who they were. Well, that's what the Supreme Court said, but here we are, multiple billions of dollars in secret money proving them wrong, and yet they won't go back and reconsider that false fact. Without that false fact, the decision falls apart because it, is, it was essential to the logic of that case. So are most of the false facts predictive uh, of what will happen if we rule a certain way, or are some of them actually false statements about uh, things that have already occurred? I think it's sort of, um, you know, you, when you're constructing an opinion, it has a logical analytical shape to it. And in order to get where the Supreme Court wants to go, they often have to fill in facts that justify and support the arguments and the logic of their decision. And what they don't do is follow the rules, which are you should look at the congressional record for facts that Congress found if you're evaluating the support for a statute, or you should look at the judicial facts that trial courts found if you're looking at the facts that support a judicial decision. Whichever way you're looking, the American system of justice puts the fact-finding elsewhere than in the Supreme Court, and for very good reason. And yet you see these false facts continuing to pop up, to prop up decisions that produce results that the big donors want. And you can go through case after case after case, and if you look forward, what they just did in Dobbs and in Bruin, the anti-choice and pro-gun decisions— was to say we're going to completely renovate the way we look at the law in these areas, and we're going to look instead at history and tradition, which means we get to make up our own facts about what history is and what tradition says. And that's why historians had such a field day making fun of the false historical facts that they found in those decisions. So it's a very broad pattern in the Supreme Court's political decision making. Yeah, I mean, on, on the Dobbs decision, when, when I saw that they were quoting uh, from old English common law, pre-colonial times, uh, two English uh, prosecutors and judges, I just immediately said, let's search and see how involved they were in witch trials. Because if you were practicing law in England at that time, there's a good chance. And of course, both of them yeah. were judges is, in witch trials. Which is a big deal back then to them. Yeah, and, and both of them were witch prosecutors, and both of them believed witches should be put to death. And it was their view of abortion that Justice Alito wanted us to adopt in the 21st century. 
Yeah. We have an American system of justice that is a very proven mechanism for making sure that facts are truthful. And that is that you develop them in the trial court where the two parties can fight with each other over the facts, where a neutral judge makes a decision. And if the neutral judge gets it wrong, an appellate court can say, hey, you got the facts wrong, but then it's supposed to send it back to the trial court to get the facts right. You don't wait until you've had the district court trial and the circuit court appeal and the arguments in the Supreme Court. And at the end of the process, when nobody can say another word, that's when you parachute in a whole boatload of false mm -hmm. facts. That's not the way the system is supposed to work. For hundreds of years, it has not worked that way. And so this is a really novel trick that the Roberts Court has pulled. And it's so novel that, frankly, academia and lower courts haven't figured out a way to deal with it yet because it's a new thing. Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Scott Perry is running for re-election. Cassidy Hutchinson, the January 6th committee star witness, described Scott Perry this way in an interview with Pennsylvania radio station WTIF in October of last year. I think it is also important for central Pennsylvanians to know that Scott Perry was at the central, was, was central to the planning of January 6th and central to the planning of operating the Justice Department officials to execute a plan that Donald Trump wanted. And what Donald Trump wanted was to essentially shred the Constitution in any way that he could to stay in power. And Scott Perry has a lot of information about that. And I think that Scott Perry owes it not only to Central Pennsylvanians, but to Americans to share what he knows. Democrat Mike O'Brien is running for the Democratic nomination to challenge Congressman Scott Perry. Pennsylvania primary is next month. Mike O'Brien is a retired lieutenant colonel who served 20 years in the Marine Corps as a top gun fighter pilot and squadron commanding, commanding officer. Mike O'Brien said this in his campaign announcement video. Congressman Scott Perry and his far right gang of insurrectionists are a threat to democracy and a threat to our freedoms. And that's why I'm running for Congress right here in my home state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania families need a fighter on their side who listens to them, who respects them, who cares more about them than about winning partisan food fights. This isn't about Democrat versus Republican. It's about American versus un-American. It's about regular people versus Washington extremists like Scott Perry. It's going to take all of us to save our democracy. So join me and let's do this together. Joining us now is Mike O'Brien, running for Congress now in Pennsylvania's 10th Congressional District. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is this would be a very important race for the Democrats to win. Uh, it, it is a, the kind of district that could, uh, with with a great campaign, if you can deliver it, uh, it could flip to Democrats. What what is your strategy going forward in this campaign? Yeah, that's absolutely the plan. And I'll, I'll say thanks a lot for having me on tonight, Lawrence. Uh, the good news, the district is winnable. Our governor, Josh Shapiro, he actually won the district by 12%. And in the 2023 municipal elections, the local elections, the Republican advantage was only 1%. So all this is going to take, it's going to take the right candidate. It's going to take somebody, I think, with a national service background who can appeal to the independents and the moderate Republicans. I'll tell you, with my 20 years in the Marine Corps, again, as you mentioned, I was a, a squadron commander, Top Gun fighter pilot. My wife, actually, she's still active duty in the Marine Corps. And we were the first married couple to command squadrons in the history of the Marine Corps. And I think that's something that resonates right here is service. Service resonates regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Is there a number one issue for your district? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's beating Scott Perry. Uh, you know, I've gone door to door and people are tired of him. He can't hide anymore. He's he's now very much on the Mount Rushmore of extremists. And we've built we built the coalition to be able to beat him this year. And I'm I'm really proud of that coalition. It includes a local the Teamsters Local 776. Labor is going to be a big part of it. Obviously, service based organizations like Vote Vets, Serve America. And the viewers are at home. You can be a part of this, too. If you go to Mike O'Brien for PA.com and contribute to our campaign to help defend democracy. 
Pennsylvania Democratic congressional candidate Mike O'Brien, thank you very much for joining us on your first campaign appearance on this program. I hope you can come back. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. Appreciate it.